Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Clark Massey, I'll give a reflection and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Clark Massey. He is the director of A Simple House. This is a ministry to the poor. They practice what they call a friendship evangelization. A lot of one-on-one -on -one work with the poor, trying to see to their material mm -hmm. needs and their spiritual needs and develop a friendship, a bond with the poor. And it's an important work today, especially that it, you know, their whole purpose is to draw people closer to God. Anytime we do that, it enriches our own life, our own spiritual life. So we're now going to a reflection with Father Mark. One of the most beautiful parables about mercy is the prodigal son. And we know when the prodigal son returns, that while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And the son had planned an apology and only got half of it out. And the father says, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was lost and is found. He was dead and has come to life again. This is a beautiful expression of, of God's mercy. You know, it goes beyond justice. Doesn't contradict it. He could have demanded the father, the son, pay back what he owes or somehow uh, make amends for the offense that the father received and being in his demanding of his inheritance. But he celebrates with a feast and with joy, a party, that he has his son back, that the, fa the son has returned to the father's house. Mercy goes beyond justice. John Paul II said it was a superabundance of justice because for us, the Father has sent the Son, Jesus, to suffer and die for us. And this is more than enough to make satisfaction for our sins, that our sins are compensated by His sacrifice on the cross. St. Paul says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin. Not that Jesus ever committed a sin, but He took upon Himself that wayward, that experience of, of leaving the Father's house, that experience of the alienation of sin, he took it in a mystical way upon himself and offered that up. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says from the cross. That was, that's our lot. That's what we deserve. And he took that upon himself. Beautiful expression of mercy. Mercy is love's second name. And God most certainly loves us. Clark Massey, welcome to Life on the Rock. Thank you for having me. The first thing I describe where you're at right now doing this interview. <laughs> I'm I'm based out of the Simple House location in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm in my wood shop, which is also where I typically broadcast from if I have to broadcast. <laughs> and I, I thought I thought you make it work somehow. It's just kind of interesting, not distracting, but uh, but. Tell us a little about A Simple House. You're the director of it. You're the founder. Tell us about the work you do. We're almost 20 years old. Uh, next year will be our 20th anniversary. And the goal was to start a missionary apostolate where we would make real friends with the poor and we'd be able to like do the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Um, we started out in Washington, D.C. We still have a mission house out there. And, and what we did is we went into public housing, Section 8 neighborhoods, went door to door, met people, and just tried to really be friends while like talking about Christ, but also helping them in real ways. You know, in one of our early outreaches, we met this woman who um, was very depressed, and she had five kids, and she wouldn't go outside very often, and we started visiting her regularly, and she was a very beautiful person, like a very beautiful spirit. And one day we were visiting her, and her daughter runs in, who was like four, and was like, um, 
mommy, mommy, your show is on, your show is on. And we didn't know what that was about. And we, we look in the back and it was the EWTN rosary, mm. daily rosary that she was watching that every day. Wow. Wow. So and her and her family ended up becoming Catholic and we're still friends with them today. But, um, that was just an interesting run in with EWTN in our first couple of years. <laughs> right. Yeah. In fact, we've got a live rosary now that we, we do that I think is real powerful after mass, but yeah, you mentioned the the friendship. You, don't you call it like friendship evangelization, like this recognition that you know conversion is possible for everyone, that we all have this call to to belong to Christ, and sometimes the poor are discounted, right, or not are overlooked. Particularly poor adults. There's people who want to reach out to the poor youth because they see some potential there, but we're trying to reach people who are really written off, like. They're, you kind of give up on the 40-year-old guy or the 40-year-old woman. And um, our model is accompaniment. Like, we're not going out and discipling or just preaching directly to people, but we're talking, we're sharing, we're becoming friends with people. And my the way we define evangelization is move someone closer to God. You know, and if it's pre-conversion or post-conversion, we're just always trying to move people closer to the Lord and help them know Him better. And you, you tell your missionaries, you have like uh, young people, 20-somethings, that they give like 10 months or more commitments and yeah. to, right, to know the poor, right? To have a real relationship with them, to meet them on the street. So we, we have our mission houses usually in rough part of town where the poor are. Um, we have people come, give a year of their life. About half of them want to stay longer after that first year. And the goal is the poor never need to know the name of Simple House. They just need to know Joe or Ann or whoever the missionary is and just know them for, you know, as long as they are there and just, you know, and we also are very much not a program. Like, like we're not like the place where you go to um, get health care, your kids in school or food, but we'll do all of that. But what we're really trying to do is just meet the family, hear from them what they want and need and then very uniquely try to just deal with them individually like that. And we call it, one of our slogans is um, an experiment in Christianity, meaning like no one's ever really totally figured out how to solve poverty yet, so we're just experimenting <laughs> with every relationship to see what works. Right. Like a subsidiarity, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And you talk about entrepreneurial ministry. I thought that was... It's, I loved it. It sounded so American, so capitalistic in one way, too. Ta tell us what that consists of. Well, I tell every new missionary that you come in, meet people, and I challenge you to come up with any idea you can think of to help them. You know, And if you can convince four or five other people in your house that this is a good idea, we will do it. And I don't want you to worry about the cost. I just want you to come up with a good idea that you believe in. And I think that's a lot of freedom. And I think it's the freedom that we're meant to have. Like if you just have a friend in life, you're not constrained or you're not told, hey, you do it this way, you know. So I'm just challenging the new missionaries every year to come up with new ways to to help people. Has there been some that really struck you over the years, some things that were effective? Um. Well, there's certain ways in which the poor are sometimes overserved. Um, in DC, like, there's some ways where you want to like have a food truck or something like that. But what the poor more need, like what the homeless more need, is people to eat with them, to meet with them, to go into their camps and spend time. You know, and so we started this uh, food truck cafe where we literally like put out some chairs and put a uh, heater up and like just hang out and have a grill and grill burgers for people. And we're using that always as like the first step to a deeper relationship, right? To the relationship that might help us bring you downtown to help you get your ID or sign up for social services or start dealing with addiction or whatever is kind of like the root cause that's keeping that person um, on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we've had some situations where we knew some mentally ill homeless over the years and um, there was no way to get them in housing because they wouldn't, whenever they got into some type of public housing, they always left it because they felt like their their mental illness themselves fell into so much paranoia they couldn't stay there. They felt like they were less safe being housed in 
the public housing than they were on the streets, which is not true, but that's how they felt. And so we've had a couple situations where the only way we were able to shelter people was to become good enough friends with them that we became their landlord. Mm. So we have a couple housing units like that where we've sheltered people who are usually schizophrenic and homeless. Right, right. And is, is most of the street ministry, is it one-on-one -on -one or is it in groups or how do y'all do that? We usually operate in twos, in pairs. Um, when we go into homeless areas, there might be a couple pairs operating in the same area. Um, it's always good to have a second set of eyes and just more, you know, presence there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's how we usually operate. Okay. Well, we're going to take a, a short little break. We'll be back uh, for you to tell us more about a simple house. So back in a minute. Clark, uh, you all you all have a couple houses, Kansas City, D.C. You live in community, or the missionaries do. They have this commitment, and they want to live a, a solidarity with the poor. Tell us what that looks like. Well, it means that when we invite people into our house, they're eating at our dining room table, you know. And when we go out with people, we're going into living rooms, and you've never you know, see poverty and really get to know someone unless you're like in their living room. Like if they're, if you're behind a desk and they're coming to you and they're telling you what their problems are, you just get a totally different view when you're going into people's living rooms. And my goal with the houses is to give people kind of a, a year of quiet, a year without the internet, a year without distractions, um, social, basically no social media. Um, and to give them a place to kind of go to daily mass and pray the liturgy of the hours while going out to do this work, you know? Um, and it's been successful so far. You know, we, we still need more missionaries if anybody knows anybody, but uh, we're, we're usually like about five, six new missionaries a year. And our ministry is usually a little bit over a dozen people total. And um, we have, you know, we've had vocations over the years come from our missionaries the past through. Yeah, it seemed like just great elements of communal life, of prayer life, service. Those are great things for just personal growth. I just thought, I got kind of excited to think of a young 20-something doing this as he discerns his own personal vocation in life. And we're, we're trying to be very simple with spirituality, like prayer is good, pover voluntary poverty is good, and the quiet is good. But then we try to give as much freedom as possible that people are just kind of discovering what their spirituality is while they're here. And St. Francis is one of your patrons. He lived a poor life, served the poor. And uh, tell us about your reflections on that, what the church has to teach us about poverty. Well, I think... Blessed be the poor is a mystery because the poor have tons of problems. And when Christ calls us and scripture calls us in general to go serve the poor, he didn't mean um, beautiful people who are hardworking and moral and have no problems besides just lacking a few dollars. You know, poverty is way more complex than that. I, I like to say that um, poverty is stranger than anyone wants to admit. Uh, we, we live in a nation right now that we have people coming into our country who don't speak the language, don't have a great education, don't, uh, aren't even given equal rights under the law, don't have access to all the welfare problems, and they do fine. You know, they, they find opportunity, they, they make their way, and they do fine. I, I've lived, I live in a uh, transitional neighborhood where people buy houses who are just first immigrants right over the border, you know. And then we have intergenerational American poverty. So we have this like problem that's persisting in America that I don't believe is fundamentally a resource problem or an education problem, because we have people without resources and education who are finding opportunity, but we have Americans who continually are getting defeated or stuck. And I think therefore it's, it's gotta be a spiritual problem, it's gotta be a social problem, a cultural problem, and really only, um, Catholics, and I even think the church is equipped to address that type of problem, there's no way that the 
new welfare program being rolled out by any politician can address the spiritual and deep cultural problem that it is part of poverty in the U.S. Right. And as you mentioned before, maybe sometimes mental illness can be involved in isolation. I, I kind of I, I worry about that in our country with the shrinking of families and divorce. You don't have much of a safety net in the family system anymore to help people when they hit hard times. What what I typically find uh, with the homeless people that we serve is you have to burn a lot of bridges in America to end up homeless. Like you've got to have um, uh, betrayed some family and betrayed some friends to, to fall that far, you know? Uh, and that makes it very tricky to help people out of that problem, you know? And it's usually due to addiction or mental illness um, that people end up there. But it's often, it's, it's only, it, when pe people only want to accept help that they feel like is coming from love, you know? If simple, you know, material help or a handout was going to get them out of the problem, they would have already been out of the problem. Hmm. And so you emphasize friendship, being with and trying to really come up with a solution maybe together with the person very in particular to their needs and so forth. I would say we always listen to what they think their problem is and we always listen to what they think the solution is and often that solution is the right solution and we just make it easier. We right. just accompany them and help it help it get done faster and easier. But if if time after time they just never have the right solution, then after two or three false attempts, we say, "How about you try one of our ideas?" <laughs> and what is the what's been the impact you've seen over the years on your missionaries, young twenty somethings? They come and do this. What happens to them? I think the greatest fruit I see is when people keep having. Um, people who are poor in their lives as real friends long after they leave Simple House. Um, we had a man, uh, a great guy, pass away uh, about a month ago, and the guardian of his estate was someone who was a Simple House missionary to him like 10 years ago. You know, um, he had no existing family or anything. And, and I really think the poor need to be part of all of our lives, and it doesn't mean like be nice to someone who's cleaning your house. It means like be at some situation where you're eating together, where you're celebrating together, where you're going to baptisms of each other's kids. Like somehow we have to figure that part out of helping the poor. And I think the, our society right now, the unless you're in small town America, the geographic distance between the poor and the rich is enormous. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that the richest kid in town and the poorest kid in town went to the same high school, and now they're separated by multiple high schools in a big city, mm -hmm. you know? So we're trying to close that gap. Um, right. And if a person wants to hear more of some of your thoughts and ideas, you have a podcast, YouTube channel? Yeah. Please check out our Simpleton podcast, and we also have a... Um, a website, a simplehouse.org. And it's all shot from the garage, right? Well, Laura uh, <laughs> Heeman of uh, Hyattsville, uh, Maryland, is also part of the podcast. She's been around Simple House since before Simple House was. She okay. was our first chairman of the board, and she's part of the podcast, too. And she's in a nice living room, right? I've seen yes. that. <laughs> well, Clark, thank you so much for joining us. Th thank you, Father. I appreciated what uh, Clark had to say. He's a thoughtful person. Yeah. He had some uh, uh, strong and powerful ideas. He does. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that really got me during the interview was that he, he just kind of threw out there that poverty is more complex than what we realize. And that there's a lot of truth to that. And it really does take an act of faith, I think, a lot of times of our own self-denial um, and really a self-sacrifice to meet people where they're at. You know, sometimes that is hard for us to do because it... It does require us to get out of our comfort zone a lot of times and to really kind of just be there for people, whether that's listening. And I thought that was a big part of their whole ministry is just listening to their whatever problem they had, but also their solutions and kind of meeting them halfway there and seeing what's kind of working with them or not. 
Yeah, that entrepreneurial yeah. outreach yeah. to them. I thought it was really, I never heard that before. Yeah. And, and that, you know, I think too, I think the point he was making was how people of faith are especially enabled to, mm -hmm. to see to these needs, like spiritual needs, yeah. you know, and there were, we're driven to form friendships, to yeah. have charity for our brothers and sisters. So people of faith need to be there. It just can't be a, a money solution yeah. or you know, a material solution. But it has to be that human connection. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah. a big part of the gospel right. that, you know, Jesus, you know, he came to us in the flesh, you know, yeah. and we're to meet others, you know, where they're at, right. you know, and that, that's the big important, we can lose sight of that. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to you, but just that call to become a disciple to others. Right. It's a big challenge he gave us all, you know, to, to really have a real friendship relationship with the poor. We can be separated in our society today. So it's a challenge for us all. So I'll send you to that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. Yeah, 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 Ready for the highest climb. God starts writing in stride to pin horizon oh, yeah. lines. Watching for the rise and shine, brighter by design. Yeah, Light the world on fire with the gleam in his eye. Yeah. I got a long list of living that I'm dreaming to try. I put my steps in any order, stepping evenly by. Yeah, I yeah. took a bite out of the sun to get my piece of the pie. Yeah, I tried yeah. to do it on my own, my roller recently dry. Yeah. I hold a shoe star right in the palm of my hand. I'm yeah. giving pieces to the masses for the people's advance. Yeah. Laughing in the face of death and evil's command. I need a no one but my maker, not the feet of a man. We're scared to death, yeah. we're scared to move huh. Comfort got you shook, froze, fear and what you lose oh. Gotta illuminate the rhythm to jumpstart their hearts Light in your soul, just gotta do your part Yeah, brilliant race for the world to see Hands and feet of his divine oh, mercy yeah, yeah, yeah. Shine your light where the darkness be And it is time for invasion, time for invasion Light coming and now the night running Got yeah. plans to advance, my stance to fight Some the poor chance and the dangerous dance that don't move down.